My name is Carter Krishnar, and I'm joined today by Robbie Musto, studio analyst for NBC Sports, covering the Premier League, and also we've seen him cover a little bit of MLS uh, thus far this season. And Robbie, uh, welcome. How are you today? Very good, thank you very much. Well, saying that, I'm a bit, I'm a bit stiff. I played over 40s soccer yesterday, and I, <laughs> you know, part of the course, I lasted about 40 minutes. I pulled my right thigh. Um, I got a dead leg on my left side and studs marks up down my left shin. So you know, part of the course. That's beauty. That's the beauty of the international break, <laughs> uh, being able to do that. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about your uh, your broadcast career and, and, and your football career. Obviously, uh, you're best known for playing for Middlesbrough, and uh, you eventually went into broadcasting and connected with an international audience. I was wondering, and I think a lot of our, our, our viewers wonder, you played with Robinelli, you played with Janino on that Middlesbrough team that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the year Robinelli was there got relegated because of the uh, the technicality, for lack of a better term. There's no, don't don't really want to have the time to hash out why you would stop <laughs> points that season, but got the two cup finals that year. Uh, tell us a little bit about playing with those guys and how that increased your appreciation for different styles of football, different cultures around football. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they were the big headline acts that, that people know about, of course, in Middlesbrough, but it started before that. I mean, we, we signed some Italian players before that, and, and it was kind of the time that the Premier League was just changing. It was becoming a, a global league, and foreign players were starting to come into the league. So I kind of... I, I spanned the, the kind of the old school approach where it was just Brits back at the start of my career in the early 90s through to the invasion of the foreign players and everything else that, that came with that. I have to say, I think, you know, I think it's brought so much to the English game. It brought so much to me as a, an individual, as a player, just watching the way that they trained, their attitude to the game, their professionalism, uh, particularly with the Italian players, uh, Fabrizio Revanelli, of course, and Gianluca Festa. Uh, Benito Carboni I played with as well and, and their training habits and stuff was, was kind of eye-opening because I, and I, I think, I think um, Viali said it best in his, in his book that he thought when he came to England that the, the training of the British players was almost fun and he saw it as work and he struggled and I think most Italian players do or did with the kind of the British attitude that was let's go and train, let's work hard, let's let's play hard together. With there, it was much more of a job, um, less smiles on the faces, and and but it, but that was fascinating with the Italians. The Brazilians were different again. Um, so, but it, yeah, it was great for me to see this uh, firsthand, and, and I think the whole of the league changed, you know, in those years. After uh, you retired from playing, you quickly uh, you moved to the states and quickly emerged as a as a leading commentator. You also coach college soccer, which I'm not sure a lot of people realize. Tell us a little bit about that experience and how you would compare what you saw at the development level uh, in the United States to what you were familiar with back home in England. And and also tell us a little bit about some of the players that came through. You were you were at Boston College at the time when you had some players like Charlie Davies, Alejandro Bedoya, and others coming through their system. Yeah, I mean, it was brilliant. That was fantastic. I met with Ed Kelly, the head coach of Boston College, and he asked me to come along and, and as a volunteer, really, and to get involved with the program. And, and you know, he, he trusted me to, to coach the team, basically, with the tactics, the technical part of, of the team. He was kind of the, the guy that, of course, selected all the players and, and made all the match day decisions. But he, it, was a, it was a tremendous learning experience for me. I did my UA for B coaching license in England, I came to the US and did my USSFB license. So it's something that I was always obviously keen to do. Uh, and I have to say, Boston College was a fantastic experience for me. The players were, I have to say, better than I expected. You know, I mean, of course, the age is between 18 and 22. The standard, I thought, was, was excellent in terms of their physical conditioning, their technical ability. You know, pretty similar to what you would see in youth teams is a professional level in England as well. So I was, I was super impressed. And the facilities, the travel, um, the ACC conference was, was very good, very competitive. And we had a great time. We won. We won the ACC that year. We won the ACC tournament. Um, and it was kind of like a, eh, kind of like a, an eye-opening appreciation of what I'd learned in the game. I can help. I can help teams and I can help individuals get better and play better and it was a it was a, it was, a, it was a just a really good experience of course Alejandro Bedoya Charlie Davis had just left when I started helping Ed Kelly at BC 
Um, but we had uh, Bedoya, who was a fantastic player, great attitude to the game um, coming through. We had some other, we had uh, Ruben Ayana, Ghanaian midfield player that I think is playing in Scandinavia. So the whole experience, I have to say, was a, was a fantastic one. Bedoya, a player I'm actually familiar with from uh, earlier, uh, he grew up in, in my neighborhood or, or yeah. nearby, and I saw him play at the youth level and in, in high school uh, down here in Fort Lauderdale. So, uh, and he's he certainly developed into into a, into a excellent pro and a reliable international for the United States. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, he uh, he was he was just trying to find his feet with BC about where his best position was. He played wide on the right hand side. I kind of liked him. In, in the hole, if you like, in behind the striker, just to get in, get involved a lot more. And he certainly was a big reason why we had, uh, you know, good success. You start working with ESPN in Bristol, and you became probably the most familiar face on ESPN soccer coverage, other than Tommy Smith, who is legendary in these parts. <laughs> uh, you, you were on Press Pass, you were on uh, the Premier League studio shows, you were on uh, the Serie A coverage on ESPN3, uh, you were uh, uh, on uh, some other coverage, also World Cup, uh, Confederations Cup, you know, Euros. Uh, talk about um, balancing your schedule it, when you had to cover so many things. Obviously, uh, the Premier League was, was the top property there as it is at NBC, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But you also had to cover a variety of different leagues, variety of different subjects. Yeah, well, ESPN, so they kind of burst onto the scene the same time as Boston College. So... I had a crossroads in around 2008, am I going to be a broadcaster or am I going to be a coach? And I just thought the opportunity at ESPN was a, was a fantastic one, so I went down that road. And then, so for the most part to start with, I was commentating on La Liga games in Spain, Serie A games, Europa League, Champions League uh, games as well. So that was kind of my star. And then you go into the, the Press Pass show, which is now ESPN FC show, which is on ESPN2. That was... That became more and more my involvement in that. Um, but, of course, they wanted to use me in some of the bigger games, the domestic games. Uh, we did some great friendlies with ESPN. The recent one at Fenway Park a couple of seasons ago was fantastic with Liverpool and Roma. Um, and, and going to World Cups in South Africa and, and, and European Championships and doing Champions League finals, it was just a great experience. I mean, yeah, I, I guess the games I covered were all over the place, but I'll tell you what it did. It, it gave me a great knowledge of, um, you know, players from all over Europe that, that stood me in very good stead for doing World Cups, where I can say, oh, I can remember, you know, Gary Medal playing for Chile, you know, as, as a Sevilla midfield player, or Ozil at Werder Bremen. And, and so I've had a real nice learning curve, and difficult to start with, of some of these European players and their stories. And it was quite hectic at ESPN, um, with different stuff that we had to do, but uh, I, I loved it, and it was a great grounding for me. We didn't actually focus too much on the Premier League. Um, they ended up, we had a studio show when it first started, then they ended up doing with Ian Dark and, and Macca from the stadiums. Um, so that was a little bit less involved, but certainly the other leagues were prominent, and uh, I just learned a lot from it. You obviously have moved to NBC now, and before we get into talking specifically about NBC's coverage, uh, Give our viewers a sense of, uh, you talk about Gary Medell, you saw him at Sevilla, you saw him playing with Chile, uh, you know, people like uh, Ozil, as you mentioned, with Bremen before he went to Real Madrid. Uh, does that give you an advantage or some sort of built-in uh, knowledge base to commentate about the Premier League, particularly with so many transfers from continental Europe these past few seasons uh, that other commentators may not have? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I talk about. It, it was a tough learning curve, but it, it, it's, it's great. Roberto Soldado, I've seen him play many times at Valencia. I know what he can do as a striker. You know, wherever I look, for the most part, even in this window, I, a good percentage of these players I've seen you know, many times, and I can add something to our broadcast, and that has to be an advantage for me. Um, you know, and it was gained through, well, I guess, four or five years of watching uh, Serie A and European football, uh, even the Champions League, Europa League, you get to see, I got to see Vertonghen before, Christian Eriksen of course now again has gone to Spurs, another player that I know all about how he plays, and of course a lot of the viewers will, you know, because I find in the US the viewers are very, have a very wide spectrum of players and football that they watch, so they probably know more than a lot of people you would think from maybe say, say the UK, uh, in terms of their, you know, they, they watch lots of different leagues, so it's good for them as well. 
Yeah, actually expand upon that point because that's been uh, something that I constantly get from my, my British friends and my associates in the UK saying you guys have so much football there on television, so many different leagues, and, and much more Premier League coverage, and we'll get into that in a minute with, thanks to NBC. Uh, it's almost as if we're spoiled for choice here. Uh, does that expand the knowledge base, you think, uh, of, the, of the fans here to where you have to be maybe even more informed to be on the telly here in the States rather than in the UK? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the, this stuff is available in the UK. That's that's what's kind of strange about it is that the, the Italian league, the Spanish league, and Germany. I think Russia as well. I think there's plenty of leagues that's shown in the UK, but there's so much interest and focus on the Premier League that you know, as a player, when I was playing, I used to watch a little bit of Spanish football, but no, not a great deal. I, I would play, train, and watch Premier League coverage, the news on that league, where in the US, and I've come out of the bubble, if you like, that is the, the, the English football in the Premier League, it's quite interesting because it's different. And, and people will talk to me about, you know, whether it's Real Madrid, whether it's about AC Milan, Juventus in Italy, whether it's about Dortmund or Bayern Munich, there's much more of a, a natural interest in different leagues. I guess if you're in the USA, you know, it's not all about England. It's about maybe European football. So you want to go see Messi at Barcelona. You want to go see Ronaldo at Real Madrid. You want to see, you know, Schweinsteiger, whoever it is in different leagues. That is different here. I think it's an advantage. And for broad broadcasting, absolutely it's an advantage. You know, Janusz Mahalik was a friend of mine, uh, was with ESPN for a long time. And he had the same, when I first went there, you know, I didn't have the knowledge base and he had it. And he, he kind of benefited from watching all the leagues that's available here uh, and just to increase the knowledge. Now, it's taken me quite a few years to get close to that, but that's what you can get when you watch all these different properties, whether it's being sports showing Spanish games or it, it's just great. It really is phenomenal, the football that you can watch in this country. You moved to NBC this past spring, uh, obviously after they acquired the Premier League rights. It seems as if, and not it seems, it's obvious that NBC has put a lot more thought, a lot more prep, and a lot more uh, commitment uh, in the way of institutional commitment into covering this league than the predecessor uh, contractors did, a, a ESPN and, uh, and Fox uh, Soccer. Uh, tell us a little bit about your summer, getting uh, up to speed, getting ready, getting prepared for the, for the launch of the Premier League on NBC, because you came out with a big bang, and it seemed like you and everybody else in the studio so well prepared, so ready for the season, and giving us the kind of insight into the league that we previously didn't have on American television. Well, oh, thank you very, thanks for that. That's very kind of you. And um, yeah, the summer was a summer of excitement. It was a summer of uh, communication. I think the NBC Sports Network and the people that run it, and Pierre Moussa in particular, who's kind of in charge of, of everything, was just super impressive. Super impressive. Um, prepared. You know, even like Pierre, we spoke every week for an hour just to go through storylines. And this is at the end of last season. So for the last month of last season, you know, some of the behind the scenes guys at NBC wanted to get familiar with the league. They wanted to know what I was thinking, what the storylines were, and understand the sport. And that from from day one, you know, way back months ago, was impressive for me. And I think it's been the same all the way through. I think that the the talent group that they've got there working, love everyone. And I just thought it was a when my agent phoned me and said that yes, that uh, NBC are, are, are super keen on you joining them. First thing I asked him was, well, who else is going to be involved? And the, and the names that he said, I thought, this is great. This is going to be, this is, if it all comes off, this is going to be a, a wonderful product, a wonderful show, different people, good, intelligent analysts. And I think it sounded good from day one. And the way that the backroom staff, the way that the researchers, Pierre, to everybody else that's helped and prepared the resource, the advertisements, the commercials, the billboards, the painting of subway trains, the whole um, commitment. Is for me, it's like sensational, you know, and, and the thought of a match of the day show, something that's so popular, been around forever in the UK, such a good show, they were going to bring that in. It seems that they've they've gone to the UK, to England, and, and just picked out the best from the broadcasters there. Sky, of course, do all the games with the analysis, with their studio guests, they break it down very well. We've kind of gone with that. We've gone with a highlight show like the, the match of the day. And I, and I honestly think that if, if I all of a sudden had the hat on, is like, right, you're going to decide as a broadcaster how we do the Premier League. 
I honestly think, I don't think I change anything. I think they've got everything absolutely spot on. We feel that um, there's still stuff that we can do better. I, I think, you know, we're, we're happy with the solid start to our campaign and the coverage, um, but we're, we're very, you know, mindful of the fact that we can all get better. We want to make it better. We want to, you know, from, from every little segment, the time given to it, what we talk about, what we show, what graphics we, we put out there is just, there's phenomenal uh, backroom support. And I, you know, one phrase that I heard from, from Pierre and the bosses at, at NBC right from the start was, we want to give you everything you need to succeed. And, and I think from on air talent's point of view, we've got no excuses. We've got research packets coming out of our ears. We've got attention in the studio. Everything is prepared super well. It's just, it really is um, a very pleasurable experience. And we're saying the same thing, Rebecca, Robbie, and Kyle. We, we're smiling. We're coming into work on, on, at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning down in Stanford, Connecticut. And we're excited for the show. We're excited to work together. So, you know, I couldn't, it's very early days yet. Of course, it's a long 10 month season. And three years, of course, is our contract with it. But so far, we've all been super happy of, of how it's gone. Take us through the match of the day uh, uh, setup for you guys. Obviously, there are more games available on television here in the United States, so it's it's not quite like it is with the BBC, where uh, in a lot of cases uh, the viewers are seeing those games for the first time. A lot of your viewers for match of the day in the states have seen these matches already, but you you give the lo level of analysis and the detail, uh, and even some of the animations and and, and the telestrator thing or whatever that that is that you and uh, Kyle Martino have played around with and Robbie Earl uh, that that sometimes you don't even get on match of the day on BBC. Uh, take us through the production of that show and how you guys compare notes. Do you guys uh, do the three of you sit down, Rebecca, uh, you and Robbie Earl or, or, or Kyle Martino, and decide what you're going to talk about in advance, and, and how do you go through? that yeah well it's tough and it's um you know it's a long day Saturday particularly is a long day and when we finish doing all our live games all the all our backroom staff come in we've got separate producers that work on the match of the day show and we basically have a production meeting because you can't you can't plan how you're gonna how you're gonna do the match of the day show because it all happens you know there's so many games going on at the same time that you need some help. You need some help about storylines, incidents, highlight packages, of course, have to be cut. There's a whole different department doing all that kind of stuff. And, and at the end of the day, from the live games, we will sit around and we will say, right, what's the biggest story? What's the biggest game? You know, what have we got to focus on? What can we talk about? What can we ana uh, analyze? And, you know, right now, it's impossible for us, whether it's me and Robbie or me and Carl and Rebecca, to, to, to look fully at all the games. It's impossible because they're going on at the same time. But we do have this, this huge screen that I'm sure you've seen behind our desk that we can see all the games going on at the same time. But it, it, So that's, that's tough about it. But what we like about the Match of the Day, and I particularly like about Match of the Day show, is that we've got more time. We've got more time to have some to and fro, some discussions, some disagreements, some analysis. The live games, you know, lineups between sound, manager's sound, between... Uh, you know, highlights of a, a different day, a different game. There's not a lot really of talk time because of ads and everything else that we have to do. Match of the day gives us that talk time, gives us that um, opportunity to, to get into some more detail. The touchscreen, the ecosystem is phenomenal. I mean, again, um, Sky used that all the time with Gary Neville as their analyst and, and Jamie Carragher. Um, that, that's something that we're going to do more of. We're just tweaking the system a little bit, but we can show kind of X's and O's diagrams. We can show, obviously, clips that we can stop, we can draw on. So that's something that's going to, again, it's going to evolve, but it's fun to do that. And, um, you know, we will take the in-between segments and it's put together. And I just think it looks, it looks great and it's very similar to what they do much of the day in the UK. And I, I thought the first one was very cool. It's on my DVR, and it's going to stay on my DVR for a long time because Gary Lineker throws over, of course, as the first one to match the day NBC style. So it, 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 I think, you know, that's something, again, that will we'll improve, it will get better, but I like the format of that show greatly. Do you get the sense that uh, because of NBC's remarkable advertising campaign, the cabs in New York City, et cetera, that we're seeing even more fans engaged in the Premier League at this point uh, 
uh, than we have in, at, at this point in any season uh, previously here in the States. I mean, I know that uh, the final day of the 2011-12 season, which uh, ESPN broadcast the Manchester City QPR game, the other nine games were on Fox Soccer, kind of brought the league into the mainstream in the sense that American sports pundits were talking about it the next day in a way that they'd never talked about the league before. But then it faded again after it, Aguero's goal was played over and over again, and then uh, it kind of disappeared again. Do you get the sense that we're back at that point, maybe, uh, uh, and able to sustain it because of NBC's commitment? I hope so, and I think that's what they've done that I've never seen done before in this country. So much promotion, so many adverts, um, the funny Ted Lasso coaching thing, which went down tremendously well. Um, you know, I watch NBC or NBC Sports Network, and there's adverts that was they're promoting it months away. I mean, I have to think that that's had a big part of, you know, we've had some good rating numbers early on. That has to make a difference. I mean, people are going to watch this league. You know, it's great entertainment value, but they've got to know about it. And I think NBC did a brilliant job of that. And I think as analysts, you know, we, we're going to try and add some color. We're going to try and add some analysis and try and, uh, obviously, we, we want to, you know, fulfill the fan, this is dedicated fans, uh, watching of a, of a game experience, but also we've got to try and include more people. We've got to try and get more people interested. We've got to show them the stars. We've got to show them. And I think this is where myself and the, and the other guys, it's important. We've got to try and show what's special about this sport, not just goals. You know, because I know that, you know, American people say, oh, only one nil or nil nil or one one. But there's so much good stuff that goes on in the game. And it's just to us through fancy technical analysis or whether it's like replays that we just paint the picture a bit better about why something happened and why it was so good. I think that's what's been fun about it. But I hope I hope it's it gets the imagination of the people. I hope that they keep tuning in. The numbers have been very good and there's no question we're going to be, you know, flat out trying to, to increase the increase the profile and make it a great experience. When the fixture list came out this summer, uh, some of us who've watched this league since the beginning, since 92, like myself, were shocked to see so many big fixtures, so many uh, potentially title-affecting and, and Champions League spot-affecting fixtures in the first few weeks of the season. Uh, how has that uh, been a challenge for you at uh, Broadcasting League, and has it maybe helped uh, NBC since this is your first year of the contract, and you have Chelsea and Man United right off the bat. You have United, Liverpool, you've got uh, uh, Spurs, uh, Arsenal, and you've got uh, the Derby, City United, coming up in uh, in just two weeks from now. The thing, thing is, though, I mean, you think about it now, I think with some of the clubs and what they're doing, there's going to be games like this every week, nearly, because whether you look at Liverpool's progression, the way that they seem to be turning the corner now and really make on a run, Spurs, phenomenal. Spurs yeah. are the big story from the summer, what they've done. They've lost their star player, but I tell you, they've, they've built half a team of, with some really good international players. United City, City, you know, again, have invested well. So wherever you look, really, Newcastle United, always a big story. Swansea City, great football. Cardiff City, promoted, atmosphere. Southampton, invested now more than they've ever done before with some high-profile names. So... Is there's not that many games that really you see the fixture and you think, no, that, you know, that might not be a great game because all the others, there's a story. And with so many big clubs spending money in, a, in a, an interesting story, they're going to play each other. So, you know, every week there's going to be something that's going to be interesting and should be a good game of football. Now, partly we got lucky with some of the early um, fixture matchups. But again, I just think there's so many good stories out there. I mean, Spurs... You know, towards the end of my career, they weren't a big story. They, they were a good club, in, in, of course, in, in North London with rivals to Arsenal, but they weren't what they are right now. Underachieving club every year, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. We, I used to go to Spurs, and we always think this is a place we can win. You, know, when you go to Arsenal, Chelsea, United, and, and Anfield, you were going to be in for a tough day. Spurs wasn't. So they've, you know, Newcastle have come on as well, really, apart from a, a disappointing year last year. So... I just think there's, uh, I mean, maybe I'm biased because I know a lot of these clubs and I know what's going on, but there's big players, big stories every week. Last question for you, and this is somewhat NBC related, somewhat uh, acclimation related uh, to the Premier League. We see uh, you obviously played in, in the Northeast at Middlesbrough for, for, for years, although people from the Northeast like to say, oh, Barrow's really Yorkshire. <laughs> um, people from Sunderland and Newcastle. But uh, Josie Altidore, big story here in the States, obviously, going to Sunderland. There's been some concern among American soccer writers that perhaps if you'd gone somewhere else in England, it's easier to acclimate. 
I know as someone who's covered this league for years that uh, players sometimes don't play as well with Sunderland or Newcastle as they would with a London club or a Manchester club. Uh, wh what do you think about Josie going to Sunderland, and how do you think that's going to affect his, his progression as a footballer? I have no worries about it, no concerns about it. There's nothing wrong with the clubs in the northeast. They're big, big clubs. The, the, the misconception comes when, if you're a top, top player, you know, you're you're a top international player, of, you know, Italy, Spain, or Brazil, or wherever. You want to be in in the northwest, Liverpool, Manchester region, or you want to be in London. But for Jose Altidore, for Robbie Musto, for lots of other players, they're brilliant football clubs. The the passion from the fans. We spoke to Jose. Uh, probably about two, maybe it was a month ago, and he couldn't believe the passion of the fans there. And uh, you know, he spoke very highly about the whole region. Um, it's a great football club, uh, Sunderland, and I think he'll do well there. And I think if you ask me, you know, maybe six weeks ago when this move first came for, for Josie, I would have been a little bit, is he ready for it? Is he ready for this challenge? Because those fans, there's going to be 40,000 for the most part. They're going to want their number nine striker to, to hit the ground running, to be strong, to be aggressive, to be score goals. And I, I, I must say I have my doubts. Now, after watching him play there for only the first two or three weeks and I haven't seen every minute of every game, it looks to me like he's up for it. It looks to me that the, he is matured, that he's more experienced, that he knows what he's got to do to be successful. That, when he was 19 at Hull City, he probably didn't know that. Probably a big culture shock. Hull City's further away on the East Coast there. Um, so to answer your question, it's absolutely a great move for him. It's a, it's a situation where he can make himself a top, top player in the Premier League. He's going to have that. The manager, of course, is in place right now, De Canio, bought him to the football club. So he's going to have trust in him. He's going to have faith in him. He's going to play him up front a lot of the time. Stephen Fletcher is back now, who's a good striker as well. But I believe that the Josie Altidore will play. And I just... I know it's early, but I just like what I've seen with the way that he's been holding the ball up, the way that he looks like he's got... See, what he's got, Josie Altidore, that a lot of strikers, and British strikers as well, hasn't got. Um, he's got the strength and the power and the aggression, which is key. He's got, to, he's got to get that. But he's got the talent. He's got the ability. He's got good feet. He can maneuver the ball. He's got skill. He can finish off both sides, left and right foot. He's got good sense of where the goal is, being in the right place at the right time, of course, is a, is a great asset for, for strikers. And it just he's just got to bring all that stuff together, and I think he, he can have a very, very good season with Sunderland. He just needs to, to, to get the goals, and to kick, because the injury came at a bad time for him, and, and Paolo Di Canio has said, you know, they missed him. They missed him in that last game, they had a bad performance. Um, but I, I, I think he's near fit now, he may be okay for the US against Mexico, I'm not sure. But uh, no, I like the move. I don't think anybody should worry that someone's not the right club for Jose Altidore because it absolutely can be the right club. He can become a star player in the Premier League at Sunderland Football Club and be, you know, a long way to go, but he can be a real cult hero at that, uh, that, that great, great club. Robbie Musto, thank you so much for your time. Keep, keep up welcome. the good work with NBC. Thank you very much.